welcome everybody. As we let everybody in, we'll get started in okay. just a moment. Wow, it's wonderful to have so many faces. So many faces. Beth, you have a little Beth, echo. You have a little echo. Yeah, I don't know yeah, why. So as everybody so comes, as everybody if you wouldn't mind just mind muting yourself, yourself, that would be really yeah, helpful. Yeah. All right, we'll see if the sound, is the sound a little bit better now, everyone? All right, well, welcome. Good afternoon, my name is Beth Specker and I am the executive director of the Rendell Center for Civics and Civic Engagement. We are delighted to have you join us in what promised us to be an exceptional discussion of the state of civics education in Pennsylvania. I'm reminded of a recent headline in the Washington Post, our democracy is ailing, civics education is the cure. I think everyone here on the call today would agree to that. Um, and are, we're excited to explore that concept with you. This is the first of a series of virtual programs that PA Civics, the overall sponsor of this program, is hosting to support educators and help restore the civics mission of schools. PA Civics is a statewide bipartisan coalition formed in 2019 consisting of former public officials and nonprofit nonpartisan organizations from across the state interested in the promotion and expansion of civics education. PA Civics is dedicated to amplifying the work of its partner organizations in order to collaboratively and collectively promote outstanding civic education and engagement programs for the use and benefit of Pennsylvania's educators, students, and citizens. I'd like to thank the PA Civic partners who are joining us here today for their support and work that has made this program possible. You'll hear from some of us directly, the Rendell Center, of course, the National Constitution Center, the, uh, the Association of the Former Members of Congress, the Pennsylvania Delegation, and the Committee of 70. Uh, but we have a wealth of organizations and you'll hear more about that um, a little later in the program. So without further ado, to kick off the program, it is my distinct honor to introduce the leader of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the 47th governor of the Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf. Governor, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much, Beth. And, and it's good to be here and with such a distinguished group. Um, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to join you today. Um, this is really important. Uh, and I did not read the Washington Post article, but the but what the way you describe it is absolutely right. Uh, civic engagement is the cornerstone of our democracy and civic education is the cornerstone of civic engagement. Um, just a little background, of course, uh, American history started in Pennsylvania. Our founders gathered here in 1776 to adopt the Declaration of Independence. And essentially what they were doing was voting to give Americans to recognize the right that we all have to de determine our own political future. The United States of America was built on the idea that a country cannot work for the people unless it works by the people. And that's why every citizen of this nation has the right and actually the obligation to vote, uh, to participate, to choose their leaders and choose the policies that are gonna make our, our nation run. Um, casting a vote is how we make our voices heard. That's the simplest way. Uh, when we do that, we determine the future of our nation, and we also are choosing the future that we want to live in. It's, it's that selfish. It's that self-serving. Our country thrives when its citizens are engaged in the political process, and while voting is a critical and central piece of that, the uh, civic engagement, it is not the only piece. Civic engagement also means advocacy. Civic engagement also means volunteering, getting involved uh, in your community. Civic engagement means talking to your political leaders uh, and raising awareness of the needs to, that you see in your community. And civic engagement actually is about becoming, as I well know, becoming one of those political leaders. 
For communities and our commonwealth to thrive, we actually need the people of Pennsylvania to stand up, get engaged, and make their voices heard. Providing a strong civic education is how we set students, students up for a lifetime of successful democratic engagement. That's democratic with a small d. I'm strong support, a very strong supporter of civic uh, education, and I'm proud to be here today to be part of the kickoff of this really important discussion. By working together, we can better prepare our education leaders to provide students with the strong grounding and civics that we all need them to have. And if we do this well, we're going to prepare them uh, in a much better way uh, to be uh, for those students to be the leaders that we need uh, uh, our democracy to have. So thank you very much. And now, Beth, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, I think everybody can hear, hear me now. Um, before we move on to our first panel, I remind everyone to please mute themselves. If you have a question, please place it in the chat. The moderators will, if time allows, address the questions. I think we're on a very tight, tight time schedule. Um, but if you do have a specific question of a panelist and we are unable to get to it, we'll share it with the panelists for response post-program. So our first panel is Civic Education Essentials for Sustaining Our Democracy. What's exciting about this panel is I have representatives, some distinguished representatives from both branches, all three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'll introduce each of our panelists and they begin with, of course, Governor Tom Wolf. And over the past seven years, Governor Wolf has built a legacy of historic investments in Pennsylvania's K-12 education system to secure success for Pennsylvania students. He created the Level Up initiative to provide 100 million to the most 100 most underfunded school districts and establish the public school fair funding formula to help address chronic inequitable and inadequate funding for school districts in the Commonwealth. And we heard of his passion directly for civic education. Also joining him is Judge Marjorie Rendell. Uh, the Honorable Marjorie Rendell is a senior circuit judge of the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, a former first lady of Pennsylvania, whose, civic, whose mission is first lady with civic education. She is the president and the co-founder of the Rendell Center for Civics and Civic and Engagement. And since the center's founding in 2014, we've helped teachers and administrators to advance the subjects of US history, government, and civics through our innovative experiential learning programs for students and professional development opportunities for educators. And then we also have joining us Congressman Jim Gerlach. Jim Gerlach is a former member of the United States House of Representatives for Pennsylvania's sixth congressional district, where he served from 2003 to 2015. He currently serves as the CEO of the Greater Reading Chamber of Alliance and is an active member of the Pennsylvania Civics Coalition. And actually most of what this PA Civics Coalition is doing is really been Jim's brainchild. So we thank you for that, Jim. He also is in the new position that he also served in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives for four years in the PA Senate for eight. So welcome to my panel. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna start, we have some overall question that I wanted each of you to answer, but in the interest of time, I think we're gonna get in the real meat of our questions. And we'll begin with you, Governor Wolf. Given your experience as a governor in Pennsylvania, what would you tell your fellow governors about why they should take action to make civic education a priority? And role, what role do you see Pennsylvania serving to prove civic education? And is Act 35 that was recently passed, is that enough? Should we be doing more? And I'll stop there. Governor? Yeah, uh, well, I think it's a really good start. And, and I think civic education is important because uh, it's, it's basically, um, uh, the, a, a, a manual, a set of instructions and directions. Um, and uh, when you buy a cell phone or you go out to get a car or, or anything like that, you, you, you take some time to try to learn about what it is that you're, you're going to be using. Democracy is not something that is an accoutrement. It's not something you're, you're a passenger on, you're a passive uh, observer. You're actually a participant. You, this is yours. And, and I think we need to, to reinforce that point. 
there are things that you can learn in civics that I think are useful in terms of how the, the system works, how a bill becomes a law, that kind of stuff. But at the, at the heart, I think we really need to make sure that everybody, every citizen knows that an active uh, role uh, is, is exactly what is, is, is uh, entailed, in, uh, what democracy entails uh, and, and asks of its citizens. You can't sit back, you can't be passive, you can't be, uh, uh, you can't abstain. You've got to, you've got to dig in. And, and uh, I think uh, civics education is the beginning of that process. It's, it's that invitation and it's the set of directions that we all need to be able to be full participants in the democracy that we have. What about Act 35 that was passed? Do you think that's enough or should we be doing more legislatively in Pennsylvania to ensure that districts are returning to the civic mission of schools? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, and the, there are a lot of uh, educators complain about a lot of unfunded mandates, but it strikes me that, that of all the things uh, that we ought to be making sure that we teach, uh, this, is, this is one of them. Uh, it's, it's like mathematics and science curriculum and history and, and, and uh, communication skills. Uh, we, we really need to make sure that the that, that people who, who leave our public school system uh, have a pretty clear understanding of, of the responsibilities and obligations and uh, opportunities they have in a democratic system. This is not just something that's an elective. This is not, it should be, you know, we, we need to make sure uh, that uh, this is, it's clear to everybody living here that this is not somebody else's responsibility, it's your responsibility. Uh, and what better way to do that than through civics education. So I think uh, before Act 35, we didn't really have a requirement. Schools had to teach it. Uh, and, and that was a, a gap that, that I think the, uh, you know, we, we, we filled in as to whether it's adequate or not. I think it's new enough that we, we, it's, it's probably too early to tell and would be unfair to, uh, to, to, to make too harsh a judgment on it. But, but I think this is one of those things that is central to, it should be central to, to our curriculum. And, and, and I think Act 35 was an attempt to recognize uh, the importance of civics education. Okay, um, and we're, there's a question in the chat about Act 35, and I know this, the Secretary of Education is gonna talk about Act 35. So uh, we'll look for him to explain that a little bit more. I, I will say, Governor, in your as a governor, would a federal mandate or federal help and federal funding for civic education, civic education at the federal level gets five cents where STEM education gets like $52 per person. Would it, would that help, do you think? I don't, I don't think so. I think, I think this is something that, that, you know, is just as well done at the state level as the federal level. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, we, we've got to be careful about making getting this too far away from from the school district that actually has to implement it uh, the, the important thing is that that the people the passion that went into to creating the act at the state level uh, is actually re reflective of the passion that exists at the school school district level and i think the farther you get away from from that the farther you get away from from the idea that maybe this is a central responsibility that we each have uh, as we impart important skills to our children all right. Oh, thank you very much, Governor. So now we'll move on to Judge Rendell. There's been a lack of attention paid to early elementary civic education. Rendell Center has spent an emphasis on working with elementary schools and the Third Circuit essay context focuses on elementary students. Why did you choose to focus on the early grades and why is the judiciary so passionate about civic education? And lastly, how can the judiciary help? And are teachers on the call? How can they look to the judiciary, for example. And I will do a little side note to everyone. Judge Rendell has an op-ed in the Philadelphia Inquirer. She had it on Monday talking about the importance of civic education. So Judge, what can the judiciary do? And why are you as a member of the judiciary so passionate about civics education? Well, let me start with your point about elementary school children. Um, we focus at the Rendell Center on fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Um, I found that that's when they are forming their relationships, they're figuring out who they are, where they fit in their community, where they fit in their church, where they fit in their family. Um, they're making friends and the relationship with 
their democracy and their role as citizens is really interesting to them. They get so excited. At the Rendell Center, we have a citizenship challenge essay contest where the students, at the top essay students come in and they put a, a skit on about their, their topic. It could be the first one we did was why should uh, or should the constitution be changed so that the president doesn't need to be a natural born citizen. So we got a lot of interest. They're excited. I speak to children all the time. And when it gets to middle school and high school, they're looking at me like, why are you telling me this? I have so much on my plate. They're a lot more jaded than these receptive fourth and fifth graders who raise their hand, can't wait to talk about it, can't wait to tell their parents that they were on a jury and a mock trial in a federal courtroom. They just get excited uh, and it's part of who they are. So later on, they're not gonna wonder, should I go to jury service? They're not gonna try to get out of it. They're going to vote because they see the relevance of it. So it, it's just an exciting environment. By the time we get to high school, the kids have self-selected and you'll have your AP government students who are interested and then the other 90% not so much. They have other, stu other studies to, to be engaged in and they're just not that active. So if we get them when they're young, we're not going to have to convince them later that they have to vote. Uh, they're, they're going to get it. Uh, so I think we're, we're fortunate that we have elementary students who are so interested. And you know, the judiciary plays a very big role in our government. Uh, people think of the courts sometime as you know, enforcers, uh, you know, and you know, indictments being brought and you know, criminal cases. But we deal with the Constitution every day, and our judges are so excited about our form of government. Um, a student asked me last week, "What would you change about our judicial system?" And I really, I really didn't have much of an answer. It provides consistent, uh, predictable laws. Um, it, it's a place where, where. Uh, people can come and have recourse. It's a place where social issues are addressed and rulings are made. And after rulings are made, everyone goes back to work the next day. They have, they have a respect for the judiciary. So we feel in the court that it's important to open our doors and let people know that we're part of the community. Uh, this essay contest you referred to is sponsored by the Court Community and Rule of Law Committee of our court. Uh, and it's an essay contest in our circuit uh, conducted by the district courts in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, and it's just one of the things we think we can do. Uh, there's so many things we do. Uh, we work with the National Constitution Center to put on judge chats when classes come into the Constitution Center. Uh, we hold open naturalization ceremonies. We have activities for Law Day, Constitution Day. Uh, our, another thing that was in the op-ed was the fact that our district court in Philadelphia is, is conducting, they're the faculty for a workshop series at the Community College of Philadelphia for adult civic education. Um, and it's open to the public, I have to go register, but our judges want to do this. We want to tell the people about what we do. We want to share the appreciation of our amazing form of government. Um, I have a this quick story Justice Souter tells about a Russian lawyer who asked him what he thought was the most important Supreme Court decision of the modern era. And Justice Souter said, well, Marbury, I mean, excuse me, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. And the Russian lawyer was disappointed. So Souter said, well, what do you think is the most important? And he said, the Nixon tapes decision, because in our country, the thought that the court could tell the head of state what to do is unheard of. And Justice Souter said he had an epiphany. We don't teach our children of how amazing our system is. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to share that good news and have people have a, a positive view of, of what we're doing. All right, thank you very much, Judge. Um, Congressman Gerlach, um, you stir, served as a state senator, state representative, and then in the United States House of Representatives. Why are you passionate about civics education and what can the legislative branch, and I'll throw it both at the state level and at the federal level, do for civics education? And then lastly, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about your work with PA Civics. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth. And first of all, thank you, Governor Wolf and Judge Rendell for your participation today. Uh, the partners at PA Civics Coalition really appreciate your leadership on this, uh, not only today, but also your, your past uh, support. So thank you for all you've done for civic education and we'll continue to help with down the road. So thank you. Um, I, I look at it pretty simply, but I think it's the right, viewpoint starting out on how we work together in civic education. I think great civic education programming produces great citizens, great citizens produce great communities. Um, 
And I think that's the engagement part that Governor Wolf was talking about, engaging in communities. And I think civics education should be about not only teaching the history of our country, the history of our constitution, uh, our form of government, separation of powers, but also from that, the recognition that we have rights and we have responsibilities. I think far too many times in our society, people talk about all the rights they have. Thank God we have them. Everything from right to free speech, worship, assembly, um, right to trial by jury, for example. But in exchange for those rights, we have responsibilities. And I think any good civic education program is going to really be focusing not only on those rights, but how you as a citizen get engaged in your community and be a problem solver. It can be a political issue. It could be uh, some other problem in the community. But how do we get the students that are going to go through civic education programming in our schools how are we going to get them engaged in the problems that exist in their community and get them involved in problem solving? And so I think that's really the great, the great uh, goal that we have in civics education, to not only have people understand what their role is uh, in their community, but then want to be proactive in trying to solve those problems and working with others to solve those problems, which may be hard, may be easy, may be something that that's, takes time, might be difficult, but what really, really is so important about civics education uh, is the fact that we can produce people in our community that will work to, uh, to solve problems that we know exist and we know need to be solved. So hopefully the educators on the line today understand that important role they play as educators to not only make sure the students understand our form of government, the separation of powers, how a bill becomes law, et cetera, but most importantly, they take that knowledge and go back into their communities and work with others to solve problems. I think if we can get them to do that, then we're creating great citizens who in turn will help solve important issues at the local level, state level, and certainly at the national level. Uh, the legislative branch serves a very important role. In fact, uh, just look at Act 35. That started as a bill that went through the House and Senate and came to the governor's desk. The governor obviously supported it and signed it into law, which then created requirement to have a civics education assessment or a civics assessment uh, between grades one, uh, eight and 12 across Pennsylvania. Uh, and the question will be, as it moves forward, its first year of implementation really was, was affected by COVID, no doubt, as, it, as COVID affected so many other educational services across the state. So in the next couple of years, how will that act be implemented across the schools in Pennsylvania? What will the results be? What kind of data can be generated to help everybody better understand what the positive impact of that educational effort is? And I think what's going to happen is folks will come forward from local school districts and local communities and say, you know what, I think this ought to be tweaked in Act 35 or that ought to be tweaked in Act 35. Or from a budgetary standpoint, the legislature might recognize or the governor might recognize in some future budget address that the funding to help support the schools to implement Act 35 needs to be increased a little bit more. The resources need to be increased. Or there needs to be more staffing at the Department of Education to help better understand the data that is collected and how we take that data and, and turn it into better policy. So the legislative process will be a very interesting one to see how we'll continue to look at Act 35, how will legislators communicate with educators back in their districts, what will they learn from those educators those parents, those community leaders about uh, how Act 35 is working and how will they take that information as a representative of people in their House and Senate districts to, uh, to better that uh, legislation in the future, either in terms of its requirements or its resources. Um, in terms of uh, uh, PA Civics and how it got started, just real quickly, the former members association, former members of Congress association say, put out a a uh, uh, proposal back a few years ago uh, asking former members to be back in their states working on the promotion of civic education uh, in their particular states. And so Joe Hoffel, who's on the line, former congressman from the Montgomery County area, and I, as, as you well know, Beth, and others started working on putting this coalition together. And it's been a great experience in terms of not only the former members getting together, but also the great leaders that you are in your respective organizations. 
And so we want to be able to help with resources, uh, putting organizations together, helping them work on different programming. And eventually not just in schools. Civic education is not just teaching kids in schools, but it's also teaching uh, folks out there in our communities about what it means to be civically engaged uh, in the right way, Civ doing it in a civil manner, doing it in a responsible manner, doing it in a respectful manner, being problem solvers. So I would envision and hope that our group can not only be supportive of you as educators uh, who have to implement Act 35 and want to build strong civic education programming in your individual schools and school districts, but hopefully we can all work together to expand this out to either institutions of higher education, but also uh, to community organizations at large across the Commonwealth uh, through the recognition across the board that all of us have that uh, great citizens are not born, they're made, uh, according to an ancient philosopher. So if they're going to be made, that has to be based on education, has to be based on community involvement. And so hopefully we can all work together uh, to achieve those goals down the line. Thank you very much, Jim. And just have a couple minutes left and maybe we'll do a real fast round in that I'll ask, um, Jim, you sort of touched on it. Why should students get involved? Um, today, the political landscape is in turmoil. Many young people don't believe in politics and government are relevant to their lives. Um, all three of you on the panel have spent your life in public service. What could you, maybe in one sentence, what could you tell a, a young student why they should get involved in the civic life in government? And Judge, I'll start with you. Well, the last few years we, with increased social media and so many issues affecting society, um, there's a lot of people wanting change. Well, how is change made? Our youth should be change agents. Get things done through the framework of legislation, community involved, protests, speaking out. So they should say, look, if you want this place to be, to be a different place and you want these issues to address, be addressed, you need to speak up and get involved. Thank you, Judge Governor. Yeah, let me say, first of all, I have not been in politics my whole life. I've been in politics for seven years now. And uh, it, it's but been- government uh, service, so. No, I was not in government service. I was in business. And uh, uh, the only time I was in government service was the year and a half I spent in, in uh, oh, yes. Ed Rendell's uh, administration. Well, that but, counts. Uh, yeah, it's, not, it's not a lifetime in politics. And that's the point. <laughs> Democracy is, is something, citizenship is something that, that is open to everybody. And it's not just voting, it's getting engaged in all kinds of different ways. And it is contentious. It's meant to be that way. And that's, that's the, the, you don't get an invitation, a formal invitation to come in and participate you are a participant uh, because you decide you want to change things. You want to make you want to you want to weigh in, and and that's what the democracy is. That's why I got into politics. I'm sure that's why Jim and Midge got into politics, uh, and and that's the way democracy is supposed to work. Jim, final comment. I, I will note Judge Rendell is public service, not politics by any means. <laughs> Jim. Well, if I was struck by any one thing more than others in my experience, 12 years in the legislature and 12 years in Congress, it is people don't realize the power they have as citizens. Uh, far too many people in our community think, oh, nobody listens to me. Nobody cares about what I think. Nobody you know, will listen if I raise my hand at a town hall meeting or I try to make a statement to some elected officials that's coming through my, my, uh, my place of business or my school. And that's the furthest from the truth. Uh, people have tremendous power, citizens, on two levels. Number one, they can certainly advocate on issues that are pertinent to that community and for which that elected official is responsible to understand and try to do something about. And what I found was, in order to better understand a policy issue, if I heard from people in the real world uh, who are experiencing that issue or that problem every day, I could be tremendously educated by their input and have a far better understanding if I just read a research paper or heard from some staff uh, person about what they thought about the issue. So I think uh, what people don't understand is they as citizens who talk to their elected officials, engage with their elected officials, not only have a tremendous power in terms of advocating for a certain policy outcome, but they can have a great impact on just the elected officials understanding of that issue, that real world impact or effect of what happens if you if you vote for and enact a policy this way versus that way. 
And if more people understood that, they'd be more engaged in this process and they'd be more engaged as a voter, they'd be more engaged between elections as an advocate, and we get, I think, better policy at the state and federal level out of it. So that's the most striking thing I found in my years of service was people don't understand the power they actually do have if they would just do it. And Jim, as a footnote to that, the Sandy Hook Promise Youth Clubs promoting the prevention of violence in schools has 3,500 clubs across the United yeah. States. When we hear from youth, they really can do amazing things. Yeah, uh, what a great way to end our panel. Thank you very much. We'll do a, a virtual silent uh, round of applause. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I'm agreeing with a comment, the panelists were very inspiring. So thank you very, very much. Now we're gonna turn it over to my uh, colleague from PA Civics. Uh, you heard him mentioned before, Joe Huffle, who is also a former member of Congress from the Montgomery County area. So Joe, uh, the stage, virtual stage is yours. Well, thank you, Beth. Uh, it's great to be part of this program. And by the way, the uh, chat room is alive with great information. So I hope people are keeping an eye on that as well. Uh, we are gonna hear a report uh, on the state of civic education in Pennsylvania from our Secretary of Education, Noe Ortega. Uh, Mr. Ortega has a broad and varied experience in education. He has been our Secretary for a year before that, Deputy Secretary for Higher Education. And before that, um, seven years in Japan at a, at a language institute, uh, 10 years in Texas uh, at uh, several public and private universities, uh, eight years at the University of Michigan. Uh, all of these positions are a combination of academic and administrative positions. So um, he, he, he knows the field uh, very well. Um, Secretary, we know that uh, Act 35 has uh, uh, required an assessment of uh, civic education uh, in Pennsylvania schools. Um, the assessments have been completed by most school districts, I believe, and the results have been uh, forwarded to your department. So we'd love to hear an update from you on the uh, findings uh, of the assessments of uh, uh, the status of civic education, and also uh, your thoughts as to what we can do to get uh, students more involved in civic initiatives. So Secretary Ortega, the next uh, seven or eight minutes, uh, the floor is yours. Sure, and thank you, Joe, and a uh, big appreciation to the PA Civics Coalition for inviting me uh, today to share some thoughts. You know, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm Noe Ortega, and I do have the honor of serving as the Secretary of Education and thrilled to discuss uh, an update on some of the things surrounding Act 35 in civics education. Uh, I wanna begin by simply sort of providing some clarity around what the Act is, Joe, for those who are in attendance and may not know uh, you know, in 2018, the Commonwealth adopted Act 35, and uh, which was referenced earlier by the governor during the previous panel. And uh, obviously, this was a first step in an endeavor to engage our fellow Pennsylvanians, you know, particularly young folks, uh, because the Act does call for each school to administer at least once within um, students' period during grades 7 through 12, an assessment uh, that essentially involves civics, right? But also includes some aspects of US history, government as well. Uh, this assessment was not only meant to measure our knowledge of the structures of government or how a bill becomes a law has been referenced earlier, but it measures the understanding of the skills needed uh, to be engaged citizens in our democracy and all the importance that comes with that as well. Ultimately, it also helps to, to assess our knowledge of skills that are needed to engage in ac actions, right? To be involved citizens of the Commonwealth and an understanding of how things like voting, which has been talked about, but also volunteering, participating in community meetings, communicating with elected officials and signing petitions. You know, all these things are things that are important to have a knowledge of. But we also have to find ways, and I think as we are working with the, co the PA Civics Coalition as well, to get additional insight on how we can prove these things, you know, we're going to have to figure out ways to turn this knowledge into applied, right? So uh, the assessment uh, obviously needs to figure out in the future on how it can begin to draw on encouraging more uh, action-oriented outcomes as well. And so a lot of things that 
could be built on that that would incor uh, that incorporate more action oriented projects, possibly, which I don't want to say are not part of schools already. Many schools have very engaged. In fact, this morning I talked to a group of students who are engaged in trying to move their own piece of legislation to the General Assembly to uh, uh, try to create what would essentially be the uh, official state chocolate in Pennsylvania. And they've been working on this as ninth graders uh, and really trying to figure out how to begin to move into this action. So I think those are other things that are not necessarily part of the assessment program that some institute that some of our schools have begun to put in place, but obviously some emerging interesting practices that we could begin to build on. I think it's important that I also emphasize a few things that I think are driven from a rationale since I have an opportunity to share this with a lot of the educators who are joining some, uh, join us today. Everyone you've talked to, including myself, has dedicated a portion of their professional life to public service or um, get, being involved and engaged citizen. And it's critical for us to really advocate and demonstrate how to be involved uh, citizens, right? To both encourage and empower groups of individuals and communities to not only understand the importance of civic engagement for the purposes of an assessment, like the one that has been put forth by Act 35, but to advocate as well on the behalf of their own needs, but the needs of the community. You know, honestly, this has never been a more important time or a particular moment in time uh, where we need to really tap into engaged citizenry, in citizenry and encourage more of our young people to be in, involved, right? We're confronted with uh, uh, and exhausted by the uncertainty and ongoing challenges that came from the pandemic in the past year. Uh, we've seen a growing distrust, right, in institutions that have been set up to protect us, to keep us healthy, to educate us, to educate us, and to serve us as well. And our Commonwealth, uh, our nation, you know, is really at a crossroads. And uh, we've been inching toward this crossroads for some time. And that's why it's imperative that we take a look at what is needed to be engaged into our curriculum and our schools and place emphasis on that. A lot of the work that I've done as an educator leader and as a scholar as well has really um, tried to shift the conversation around education to move away from what most people would term as private good outcomes. Those are the outcomes that are associated with what the individual benefits for educational attainment are to us, right? Things like social mobility, which are important, economic prosperity, uh, better health outcomes, and move us towards gaining a better understanding of the civic outcomes associated with educational attainment, right? That's what the conversation is about today, educational attain attainment and how that can be translated into more civic actions that creates a more responsible and engaged citizenry. And that is something that we've really seen that's much needed from many of the things that happened in the past 18 months in particular, right? The only way that we were able to move past some of these challenges is to work collectively. Uh, this sort of collaborative spirit of being involved is also an outcome that I see that must be learned through much of our civics curriculum as well. You know, uh, and to quickly mention in terms of thinking around what the assessments uh, are supposed to yield, right, and produce. Uh, obviously, we moved into the application of Act 35 during a really interesting time as it relates to assessments, right? And so one disrupted by the pandemic. And so many of these assessments that we hoped by, by now we would have enough data to think about what's needed to move forward, what changes we need to make are still going to be an ongoing process of collecting information, right? So at the moment, the department is sorting through a lot of its findings around assessment to make determinations about what this means anecdotally, what this means empirically. And uh, you know, once those outcomes are produced, we're going to begin to be ready to share those findings with a number of folks. But at the moment, what our emphasis has been is how can we think about the standards that are informing the civics education? You know, I think someone shared a study earlier with regards to grades that are given to the standards out there for civics on various states. And we've got some work to do in Pennsylvania. In fact, to work with our State Board of Education, to work with our uh, educational stakeholders to figure out how we can align those to what's needed for the current needs of our young folks, right? Things that really tap into emerging issues and concerns that are important to young people. I don't think young folks are going to be encouraged to get involved if they don't see the issues that they see most important in their lives or affect them most closely really talked about and uh, integrated into many of the discussions we have 
around what's important. And I think for a, much, a number of young people, they need to see those issues reflected, right? Oftentimes, and it's been the case that the department has really placed an emphasis on this, uh, young people aren't invited into discussions and conversations about things that impact them. When I reflect on many of the difficult decisions that have been made in the past 18 months, uh, many of them about the provision of learning, we've engaged members of the General Assembly, we've engaged members of the public, we've engaged parents, but oftentimes we've not heard the voice of our young students. And I really feel like that's an area where uh, inviting them into these discussions really gives a, a chance for them to elevate the things that are important to them. Uh, I know schools are beginning to move in this direction as they begin to think about some of the things that they put in place. And uh, many of the structures that we've set up here at the Department of Education or that we work on to inform our issues are now inclusive of inviting students to have a seat at the table. And for us, that's also another demonstration of how we can begin to really uh, advocate but place emphasis on the importance of civic engagements for young people and invite them into this discussion. I think once those routines, those invitations are set up and become more frequent, we're going to see uh, a number of young folks get re-engaged in discussions of issues that affect them and really um, ultimately improve the way that they're going to meaningfully engage in society. I want to sort of place an emphasis as well that as we as educators and many of us are here today engaging in this discussion begin to think about civics and what it means for our students. Often we have to really emphasize the importance of how this is a dialogue that young people need to have with many of the things that are taking place in society right we don't often see this meaningful engagement as a way to communicate the very act of engaging in certain behaviors around volunteerism showing up at events. Uh, being able to uh, air their concerns or their voices in platforms that are in front of them that they can invite themselves into. This begins a meaningful dialogue, an advocacy tied to sort of social justice imperatives that many of them hold in high regard. And I think when they begin to think about civic engagement from that aspect, I think we're going to begin to see a lot more changes. So Jim and others, you know, these are some of the things that uh, the department is beginning to think about and uh, really begin to integrate with a bunch of their learners. I think we're also in a really interesting position at the moment where we've had some significant disruptions to the way that learning and the approach to learning is happening in our classrooms, right? We've had to introduce things like remote learning, but also additional activities that folks can begin to engage with to supplement their learning in the classrooms. And I think this presents us with a really interesting window of opportunity to begin to invest in to figure out how we can use those platforms to elevate certain discussions. Young learners now have access to people across counties all over the Commonwealth. They can mobilize and begin to engage in concerns that where they share similar uh, issues with folks that they normally don't interact with. And they can begin to learn from perspectives that may, be, may not be available to them, right? Whether it's perspectives from people that represent a different geography, or those who might even represent a different race and ethnicity. And the platform is not limited to just the Commonwealth. It opens the doors for young folks to engage into these conversations in, in a number of different ways. And I wonder what that's going to mean for us to be able to um, invite and create more learning opportunities in an applied learning space for our young learners. So I hope this provides you with sort of an overview uh, with regards to what the department has been doing. I'm happy, Jim and others, to answer any questions that folks might have. I haven't had a chance to pay close attention to the chat as we were having this conversation, but uh, if there are some questions there that I might be able to provide insight if we have time, I'm happy to do so as well. Well, thank you, Secretary. Uh, our time is short, but I have one quick question for you. Sure. Um, how many school districts uh, have participated to your satisfaction in the Act 35 assessments? Sure, and so obviously, Joe, it's a requirement <laughs> for the schools to participate because of requirement in law. With regards to our satisfaction, you know, I, I do think that uh, I th everyone is involved in some level of engagement with the assessment. We have not had a chance to really circle back and make a determination on what that meaningful engagement with the assessment would be, right? And I think that's something that we're prepared to do. So I don't want to stand here in my position to say, to call out schools that did well or did not do well. But um, this is something that we're going to pay close attention to and begin to work closely. So Great. sorry, I don't have more specifics with that, but I, I do want folks to know that 
you know, the uptake and the calls for the department to think about this more seriously and make it a very pronounced part of its uh, policy priorities. We, you know, we've been revisiting standards around science. We've been visiting revisiting standards in a number of areas. This is one of the areas as well where a number of folks are calling for the Department of Education to work more closely with the State Board of Education to think about meaningful standards around civics and civics learning as well. Well, great. Well, Secretary, thank you so much for your time and for your presentation. We appreciate it very much. Uh, our next panel is a, um, a, a report on civic education on the ground, and it is led by the fabulous Dr. Carrie Sautner, who is the Chief Learning Officer of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. Carrie, take it away. Thank you so much, Joe. And um, that was really an inspiring piece. So thank you both so much for that. And I will warn my panelists as we come in, I changed your first question because Secretary Ortega got me so excited about student voice and student agency. So blame him on that one. So first, let me welcome everybody. Excited to see you. Like Joe said, I am the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And you all know, and we know that civic education needs to be championed at every single level of the school community. But one thing I wanna make clear, and I heard Jim say this earlier, and the governor say it as well, that civic education needs to be championed at every area of our community. That means the businesses, that means community members, that means school systems. Our school leaders at every level are doing the hard work every day to shore up this democracy. And what we're gonna talk about today is what that looks like. So we're excited to ce celebrate the good work, but also know that there is a lot of work to continue to do. So we've got a great panel for you today. This is the Rockstar panel. Not that everyone isn't the Rockstar panel, but we have a, the superintendent, Michael, and Michael, I'm gonna get this right, Vukovich. Michael Vukovich is the superintendent of the Indiana Area School District. His teaching certification is in secondary social studies, and he has been involved in leading civic education in two districts, the Greater Johnstown Area School District and the Indiana District. Michael has this in his letter to parents. My guiding principle as your superintendent is based on the belief that every child can and will attain the education and skills necessary to achieve their dreams of a meaningful, bright future. And we all know that includes civic education. So welcome, Superintendent, glad to have you here. Our next panelist is Jim Kearney, Dr. Jim Kearney, who's a curriculum spe specialist. Dr. Jim Kearney is the Assistant Director of Teaching and Learning at the Radnor Township School District. And he provides leadership for K through 12 social studies education and other disciplines. Dr. Kearney was, the, was a national board certified social studies teacher and has been elected to four terms on the Pennsylvania Council for Social Studies Board of Directors. And he currently serves at the National Constitution Center's Teacher Advisory Board. So welcome, Jim. Next on our panel is Brittany Jennings. Brittany Jennings is an amazing teacher of African-American history at Constitution High School in Philadelphia. She earned her master's of, in education from Temple University and is qualified to teach both middle and high school students English and social studies, as well as a push. Brittany, I'm gonna nod to you when we, the teachers in the chat keep talking about ELA and social studies, you're gonna bring it together for them. She's also an expert and one of our key leaders on the teacher's advisory board in teaching not just social studies, not just English and brilliant primary sources, but also an expert in teaching civil discourse and dialogue. And her students have trained Philadelphia police officers, officers, Camden, New Jersey police officers, and Virginia police officers as well. So she has done it with every level and across the entire country. And finally, our fourth amazing panelist is Taylor Carthwell. She is majoring in middle level education with a focus on social studies at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. She was the 2020 recipient of the Upper Level Middle Education Student of the Year, which is an award that is annually given to students who major in upper level middle education and demonstrate, demonstrate academic ex excellence, leadership involvement, and extracurricular activities. So thank you so much to the four of you for joining us. And here is your first question. I'd love for this to be a fun speed round because we, we have short time, but brilliant minds. How do you invite students into the civic education discussion at your school? 
and in your community and your civic world. So Michael, let's begin with you. Oh, thank you very much. Are you able to hear me? Did I come, am I coming through okay? Perfect. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank Governor Wolf and Judge Rendell for all their leadership, as well as our school board and some of our great teachers are on the call, because it really starts and, end, starts and end with our teachers and our school board. One thing we do that I think I'm quite excited about is we provide our students the opportunity to make sure their principles are followed by our practices. And what I mean by that, we allow some of our students to be on our school board. Uh, they are a non-voting member, but they have, a, have the opportunity to come and see governance in action to give input and give feedback. I think often so many times we make decisions uh, for the kids and not with the students. And we want to really, our board deserves a lot of credit for really looking at that and examining what can we do to make sure that, again, that our principles are followed by our practice. And what we did is we looked at a systems look approach about, look, when we look at government, we talk about civics, what do we do to really emulate uh, a government by practice of, of the people, for the people, and by the people? And we give them a, a tremendous amount of opportunity to have a voice with at the local level in their own schools, but also at the level on, in the district. And I also like that really um, give some credit to our teachers and our board also. You see a real connection now starting to happen with career readiness, social emotional learning, and civics. If there's one thing that pandemic taught us with some of the fierce debates on uh, school board meetings or on government in general, is the need to teach kids how to dissent with dignity and how to have fierce conversations. But it's okay to disagree. It's okay to have different opinions. But how can we work through those things together? And those are some of the great things that are going on in our districts. And we're looking at some other things too. Youth courts are an example of some of the things we're doing. The student uh, board member I spoke about, the SEL civics and career readiness is a piece. But the, the goal is you gotta give students time to practice their voice and how they use their voice on a daily basis. Assume they could do that right out the gate. It takes time, it takes practice. And that's a part of what we're really trying to refine at the Indiana Area School District. Because I think we take a position and I'm not gonna say I'm right. I'm just gonna tell your position. You know, graduates who lack, I, mean, I know there's some uh, chat, there's some chat room comments about ELA and math. And I guess the point I'm going to make with this is graduates who lack basic skills uh, may be unemployable and represent personal society tragedy. I get that. We're not okay with that. But however, graduates who possess basic, basic skills but are only partially informed, unable to think, and incapable of making moral choices are downright dangerous. So we have responsibility as a system how to give kids that opportunity to grow, to think, not to tell them necessarily what to think, but how to think, and to cover and develop their own opinion. And before we can make workers, uh, we must first make people, but people are not made. Uh, they're born and they're conserved and grown over time. And that's a lot of great works that are happening in our school. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And uh, Dr. Kearney, I'll turn it to you next. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I think the most direct contact that our students have with our schools are through their teachers and the, the, the relationships our teachers have and the community they build in their classrooms is a, a perfect entry into civic participation, but also the understanding of what it means to be part of a community, a positive, constructive, equal, collaborative member of a community. So that's something that's a, a big important, a big importance to our schools and our students and our teachers starting at the elementary level. Classroom communities, developing rules and classroom constitutions to help, help decide what is it that's gonna help this group of people grow and learn and coexist together. Going beyond that, we do offer civics education at both the elementary, middle, and also the high school level. And we try to, we try to provide opportunities for performance assessment. So students are gonna be given opportunities to engage directly in civic processes through things like writing a letter to a public official as part of a common assessment that all students as part of a course might do. So we do try to give them those opportunities for authentic civic engagement and model the practices we, we would encourage them to participate in, not just only here as, as students, but as they become older citizens upon graduation. We also offer a lot of extracurricular activities, some of which uh, uh, Superintendent Vukovic had mentioned there. We have students who sit on our school board, both at the curriculum committee at the committee level and also give reports to our school board on a monthly basis at their business meeting. But there's a lot of opportunities for students who've got particular interests in model Congress, the student government in their schools, service through clubs and organizations. So we try to have a, a healthy balance of not just instruction on the civic knowledge that had been mentioned previously, but also opportunities to develop those skills and engage in those actions that we would like students to, uh, to begin now and continue with them into, into and through adulthood. Fantastic. Uh, Ms. Jennings, would you like to talk about how you ensure your students are probably not just at the table, but running the table? <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I teach at Constitution High School, and first I'll talk about a little uh, on the school level. So our school, 
um, is Constitution High School. And our students in the past were actually involved in creating the Constitution for the school. Um, and students, as they you know, matriculate throughout the, uh, their ninth through 12th grade years, they also have an opportunity to be a part of student government and amend any of um, the things in the constitution that they take issue with or the things that they feel as though need to be adjusted um, on a classroom level. So I teach African-American history and contemporary issues. Um, and my students are heavily, heavily involved with student-led discussions that we have weekly that are focused on the issues that uh, they're concerned about. Um, I find that students, if they don't see themselves in history, then they're not going to want to take part in any uh, act of change or they'll, they'll, they won't be as engaged. Um, so our weekly dis discussions consist of students um, posing their own issues, um, bringing in the resources, cultivating the questions, um, and then all the students engage. And sometimes it does get a bit hairy. And sometimes um, the conversation, you know, has to stop so we can reflect and think about the way in which we could address the issue once, you know, our heads calm down a bit. Um, but I think what's most important is after the discussion, there's a reflective piece. So the students are able to take apart what we discuss in class and focus on, well, uh, what's, what's strong about this conversation? What is weak? What are areas in which we can improve in this conversation? And then what are the action steps? Um, our students are involved with the Policing in the More Perfect Union program at the Constitution Center, where they not only um, are talking to police officers, but they're facilitating those conversations. So we spend a lot of time with uh, cultivating questions um, that will gauge the conversation through multiple perspectives. Um, the students also have run a lot of the PDs at my school. So that way, not only they're, they're not only seeing Harkness discussions in my classroom, but they're also seeing it in their science classroom and their math classroom, because you know, civic education is interdisciplinary. And I think someone said that in the chat, but it is interdisciplinary and it doesn't, and, and it shouldn't fall on what's considered, quote unquote, um, the humanities subjects. So they're, they are advocates in their own ways and they make me smile every day. Um, but I think the thing that uh, stands or sticks out the most um, in my involvement with them is that you see them progress over time. You, just, you see the student who doesn't wanna say that much in the class and by the end of the year, you know, they're journaling and by the next year, um, they're facilitating a Harkness discussion. And then by the next year, they wanna join a student organization. They wanna attend a town hall meeting. A lot of our students are very active um, and participate in the school board meetings and those meetings are long. Um, so it's, it's a progression that happens over time and I'm just excited to be a part of it, honestly. Thank you, that's fantastic. Uh, and Taylor, you really have the opportunity to answer this either way as one of our leaders and future leaders in education, but also as a student at the college level, how are you engaged? So feel free to take any direction you want with this one. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, so at the college level, um, something that we do a lot, um, actually when I was taking methods courses and field practicum courses, we would do something called a fishbowl. Um, and so what we would do, would we would be put into a circle um, and we would be given a topic and then we would have to discuss that topic with one another. Um, and I believe that I could easily take that, again, I'm middle level, so I'll be t uh, certified fourth through eighth grade, but I believe I can take that um, to those students at those, at those grade levels. Um, and what I plan on doing with my students um, that I've thankfully learned at the college level is to put them in a half circle or a line and make it seem like a sort of spectrum and I want to give them easy topics at first. So um, I want you to defend whether you like hamburgers better or hot dogs better. And then people that vote strong for hot dogs, one side of the spectrum, someone that votes strong for hamburgers on the other side, those who aren't sure in the middle. Um, and then I want them to give me a reason that they like that. Um, they chose their stance. I want them to defend their stance. And then I want to teach them how to listen to one another. And I believe as we start to implement this into the classroom, I can also incorporate more difficult topics then too. Um, so I believe that this is a good way to teach students to take a stance, defend their stance, listen. And then I want them to reflect on it too. I know Brittany said about that. Um, they take a time to reflect. And I want to take time for the students to remember where they were 
And then I want them to reflect on where they are now. So the goal throughout all of this um, is for them to be able to move place to place. So if someone is a strong on one side, um, I want them to see if they moved because they listened to somebody in their classroom and their other classmate was able to change their mind on things. Um, so I believe that these are huge components to civics, um, taking a stance, defending your stance, listening to other people's stances, and then being willing to say, okay, yeah, I believe that this person is right. And I would like more perfectly align with their stance. Um, but yeah, those are some things that I learned, I think, at the college level. Um, right now, throughout my student teaching experience, um, I'm teaching American history. Um, and so I have seen some of this incorporated into that. Um, but for a civics, for a civics class, as I, if I ever have the opportunity to teach that, um, I think definitely um, these performance-based and discussion questions will be the most influential for my students. Thank you so much. And that really inspires our next question. So we talk about some essential elements. What are the essential elements that makes a civic education experience really work and click? And what I would love to kind of challenge everybody to answer is not just what you have experienced so far in your educational leadership positions. What does work for you? And tell us that because we all want to learn great techniques and great tools. So a fishbowl, a Harkness discussion, all these pieces. But where's your stretch goals as I, as I go there? Like where do you think in the next year you'll be stretching your students, you'll be stretching your school leadership team, you'll be stretching your teachers to say, what do we need to do next? And again, back to Secretary Ortega's point is, we still have more work to do. So think about what works really well and share that with us and then where you're stretching in the next year. So let, let's mix it up a little. Uh, Ms. Jennings, would you like to go first? Um, sure. So I think, um, I think the strength is cultivating an environment of trust. Only I say this because students, we know students are, are disengaged for various reasons, considering what's, ha what's happened in the past few years. Um, but I think in order for students to get involved in the classroom level, they have to trust the space that they're taking up most of their time in. Um, and a lot of that falls on the teacher, um, and I'm a teacher. Um, we have to make sure that we create a, a line of communication so that way our students um, can get to know us. They understand our positionalities, we understand our positionalities, and then we are also open to learning um, where, where they stand uh, their ground on, even if that changes over time. Um, and I think when students or, or when teachers uh, create that environment, um, you will find that more students will branch out to confine in more teachers. Um, a lot of times you'll see certain students will only talk to a certain teacher or feel like they can only talk about certain topics in certain classes. Um, when, like I said before, civic education is interdisciplinary. And I think uh, teachers have a lot of work to do on top of all the work that we have to do. But I also think that work um, it, it best creates uh, active students in the classroom. Uh, my stretch point would be, I think the stretch point honestly would be um, the school buy-in, whole school buy-in. Um, a lot of times, and this isn't just speaking, me speaking on my school, but I've, I know other teachers in other districts. I think a lot of times teachers don't feel supported. Um, and then that sort of causes a, a, an apprehensive um, space that they're in when students want to go and participate in certain, um, you know, engagements or, you know, want to take stances and, and maybe protest. Um, and it, it creates a challenge because when you are uh, encouraging students to take, you know, take a stance on an issue and then allowing them to exercise, you know, however they choose to take that stance, um, they want to make sure that they have your support. And if they're met with apprehension, then they start questioning, well, maybe I shouldn't go about it this way, or maybe, you know, maybe I shouldn't talk about this in this class. And education is, is a space for, for students to share what's important to them, even if that doesn't align with what's important to you as a human. Um, but we should be able to share those opinions on all sides of the line um, as educators. So I think the stretch would be uh, providing supports for educators um, when they're met with stances that may be more challenging in certain aspects so that students still feel empowered even if 
um, what they are um, fighting for or fighting against or protesting or speaking upon doesn't necessarily align with like your personal viewpoint. So having that like objectivity um, or that that support uh, would be the stretch. Love it. Now, uh, Superintendent Vokovich, one, we're gonna target you a little bit narrow because you do reach so many children. Could you answer that same question about successes and stretch, but think about the younger kids because Myron does bring up, you know, what do we do for the K through four, the K through five, Judge Rendell brought it up in the beginning. So what are some of your successes with the younger students? And what are some of the areas you wanna stretch your teachers teach working with the younger students to engage civics at a younger level? Yeah, I'll start with the stretch. I think the biggest thing is we have to embrace discomfort. We have to be able to teach kids how to have these crucial conversations in a diplomatic and respectful way. And I think that takes time. When you look on TV nowadays, people are scared to talk about certain topics, the way schools are being chastised or critiqued or condemned. So how do we have the courage to have to embrace discomfort? How do we have the courage to continue to give kids opportunities to really embrace that discomfort? As far as what we're doing at elementary level, a couple of different things. Uh, like Brittany and others have said, we're inter interwoving, interweaving um, some of the work we're doing in the area of social emotional learning, ELA, and mathematics, and we're giving kids opportunities to practice those type of uh, skills and opportunity to give back to their, their community, opportunities to have crucial conversations. Um, my son, he comes home all day and we have a conversation about what um, civics looks like in his school and how he's given back to his, uh, to his community and how we're giving kids those opportunities. But I think, you know, it's a, the it's a best recipe when they're all in a like I said, interwoven together, uh, we have to teach kids the ability to have uh, a growth mindset and be able to take different opinions. And that takes time to grow that and, and really cultivate that type of mindset. And we have to go away from, you know, the, the mundane work to really have crucial conversations in our schools. And that takes time and it takes uh, skills, right? When we talk about that interweaving of disciplinaries, think about the social emotional skills, but also the reading, listening, speaking, writing skills that are involved in being able to articulate yourself and your views and your thoughts and your process. So we spend a lot of time, and I think at the heart of that, at the heart of what we do is relationships where kids feel comfortable and safe to have this conversation in your classrooms. And it's not one and single ingredient, it's multiple ingredients together that make a warm, cultivating school environment that allows kids to grow. Uh, for example, one thing that always comes up is time. We switched our literacy program to more of the science of reading. In this case, we do a lot of work in core knowledge, language arts, and there's a huge amount of science and history and social studies embedded in our ELA work. So there's really opportunity that we're not saying, look, it's not one or the other, it's both. And how to really have conversations about the work we're doing. And I think that's meaningful for kids. It really, it really is important for us. And we keep moving on. We talk about trust. We talk about relationships. We talk about time. We talk about um, really building opportunities for skill building. Um, Dr. Kearney, you want to look at this and also think about how the teachers, what are the successes and the, the reach that we do in supporting our teachers in this good work. So we need to support, support the elementary school kids all the way through K through 12, but the, also the educators need this support as well. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think our, I think our teachers do a really nice job of, of knowing their students and valuing their voices in the classrooms, engaging them in these conversations we want them to have. But I think as was sort of alluded to earlier, with the polarized society the way it is now, I know that a lot of our teachers and other teachers elsewhere feel a little hesitant sometimes to engage students in, in substantive conversations about some of the issues, just not knowing exactly how it's going to go or how it's going to be responded to uh, from parents and other perhaps uh, community members. So I think supporting our teachers in that way, both with professional development and helping them understand how to engage in those conversations, where they might be a little bit more hesitant than they must have, might have in the past. And I think another opportunity for growth for both adults and students is, is similarly media literacy. As they're researching these issues, how well we're equipping them to ensure that what they are, um, what they are making sense of and sharing is truly accurate information. I think that's these are ongoing challenges that are becoming even more pronounced there. Other opportunities for growth is the authentic connections to the world outside of school. Um, the Constitution Center does a nice job of, of, of linking together classrooms from around the country through the constitutional exchanges to allow students to engage in, in civic dialogue around constitutional issues. I think those opportunities are terrific. And then also opportunities for students to practice authentic democracy in their schools. Student governments take a variety of different forms and they're great opportunities. And I think that's another area where, uh, where schools continue to grow and, and let students practice, uh, practice democratic citizenship um, throughout their career. 
practice. Everything else we practice in our life, we need to practice citizenship to and engage now and through. So Taylor, bring us home with how do you want the new educators going into the field doing this work? What do you want to see new educators really stretch their skills and their goals with when they come into the classroom with a fresh set of eyes and a whole bunch of energy to learn from the teachers that are there and to build their students? So what I want new educators to do um, is to really, especially for civics, focus on those real world experiences and the performance based assessments and those discussions. Um, so the, both of those will go into the real world experiences. If we're having discussions, we're going to have difficult discussions in the real world, um, whether we don't like conflict or not, they're going to be there. Um, and then I have a great memory. Um, of sixth grade and something that I got to do, it was during the 2008 election, was they set up a little voting poll and I had to go and there were pictures of the candidates there and I got to go and mark which one I wanted to vote for and put it in the box. And then we got to see who won the election in the sixth grade class. Um, so just those types of things, I think will give students um, the, the ability to participate in these things, even though they're not at an age where they're able to participate at this way in the way that we are. Um, but it also shows them that their voice matters because especially if it's a close vote, one voice can shift the tables if one person wins or the other wins. So I think that shows them that their voice is extremely, extremely important. Cause I've heard a lot of times people who don't wanna participate say, well, it doesn't matter, my voice doesn't, it's not gonna do anything. Um, but I think that kind of shifts that and debunks that and shows them, yes, your voice does matter. I also think for stretches, what I want us to do is to be great devil's advocates. Um, so I remember having great conversations with some of my friends after class where we would have these discussions and the professor did such a good job at defending different points of view that at the end of the class, we would have a discussion and we would sometimes fight and say, oh, well, I think this is what he believed because this is what he said, or no, this is what he believes. And we never actually found out what the professor believed because he did such a good job at defending both points. And I think that's so important because as a teacher, we learn to read facial expressions. And so as soon as someone says something or if a teacher would say something that would just, um, hurt the student or kind of embarrass them a little bit about something that they believe, you can see on their facial expression that they're going to shut down and they might not be willing to participate in those types of discussions anymore. And they could carry that with them um, throughout the rest of their life if they, if they encounter something and they're embarrassed by what they said or they don't want to share their opinion. Um, I believe that being a devil's advocate for these students is extremely important, not embarrassing them, but being fair and holding your ground and defending both points without letting the students know what your actual view is, is so important. Uh, Taylor, thank you so much. What a brilliant way to wrap us up. And from a nonpartisan institution that teaches about the constitution, we like the pot stir on all sides on constitutional questions. So I love that idea of devil's advocate. Thanks to this fantastic panel. We appreciate you so much and could spend the entire afternoon with your brilliance and your amazing work. And we really kind of all wanna go back to school and go to school with you all. So thank you so much for the work you're doing and the work that you will be doing. Without further ado, let me turn it over to Lauren Cristella from the Committee of 70, who's about to kick off best practices in civic education across the Commonwealth. Lauren, to you. Thanks so much, Curry. Uh, welcome everyone. As Corey said, I'm the Chief Program Officer of the Committee of 70, which is a nonpartisan good government group and civic education center in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Uh, and for funsies, I'm also the president of the League of Women Voters of Philadelphia, and it's great to see so many League members here uh, in, the, in the participant list. So thanks everyone for joining us. And I'm very excited to get more best practices. We heard a lot of great examples of things uh, happening in classrooms from the last panel. I'm excited to talk to this fantastic group here uh, to, to find out some more. And let me introduce everyone here. Sue Anderson teaches eighth grade civics at Mount Nittany Middle School in the State College Area School District, where she's in her 19th year with the district. Congratulations on that. She jumped at the chance to teach civics after having taught ninth and uh, 11th grade for over a dozen years. 
and she's Pennsylvania born and educated and a proud member of the Constitution Center's Teacher Advisory Council. Thanks, Sue. Andrea Lehman is a fourth year US government and politics teacher at McDowell High School in Erie, Pennsylvania, where she teaches US government and politics as well as intro to criminal justice. She's a member, she's also a member of the NCC's Teacher Advisory Council. Thanks, Hi, Andrea there. And Abigail Dim. Abby is a joint PhD student in education and political science at the University of Pennsylvania and a former student of ours at Penn when I teach when I was at uh, the Fells Institute of Government, so I've never here. She studies political knowledge and socialization, civic education and political engagement, and the governance and politics of education policy. Abby is also the director of research for PA Youth Vote and a fellow at the Netter Center for Community Partnerships where she collaborates with local high school students to create, uh, to co-create knowledge about youth, political uh, knowledge and voter engagement. Prior to graduate school, Abby was an AmeriCorps volunteer and a social studies teacher. So thank you all so much for being here and sharing your, your wisdom and expertise with us. Let's get started. Uh, question for the group. What do you believe are the hallmarks of a good civics education? Andrea, let's start with you. Um, well, so I, I actually, I have uh, what Judge Randell called the jaded group uh, of students. I have those seniors that, you know, they come into my classroom and they're like, it doesn't matter to me. I don't like government. And, um, you know, and so I, my big hallmarks of good civic education is to like motivate students to realize that it does matter to them. And you know that we're gonna have discussions in this class, and you're not gonna like what you hear. Um, so a lot of my homeworks are, you know, this keeping an open mind when you have discussions with people who you don't agree with, because it's a fact of life. Um, and to think critically about things, you know, just because you see it on the news doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Um, so I really try to push and and highlight those my 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 main hallmarks of you know just you know it does matter and you will have these these problems and we're going to have to talk about them that you can't just live under a rock uh, for the rest of your life and so you know civics education is that key and in that home, in that way to talk about things that you don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about yeah i think i saw it was secretary Zorchek in the in the chat mentioned dissent with dignity and i loved that phrase i wrote that down that's that sounds like a key element of that but Sue, how about, how about your hallmarks? So I would um, echo many of the things that Andrea said. Um, I have a different disengaged group. I have eighth graders. So I uh, often hear, I'll worry about this when I'm older. Why do I need to care about it now? Um, politics is messy. I don't understand it. Uh, but you plow through it and I, you know, try to find ways that I can connect with them. Um, we talk about their constitutional rights as students, which they don't really know that they have. Um, and there are ways that I can engage them in, you know, repeating some of the other things that have been said about building rapport. Um, that's a great way to engage. But I would also say that um, a hallmark of a good civics education, I would go back to what uh, Governor Wolf said, it, it is a manual for how we conduct our lives, how we participate as citizens. And I think it's really important that the students learn the basics of how their government works, what's in the constitution, um, all of those, those things. And, I think they should have the opportunity to do all of that in an engaging and authentic way. That's great. So, and Abby, would you add to that? Sure. Hey, everyone. Yeah. So, um, this uh, this is a perspective which I'll say is sort of research based, um, but I know that there's like the high level thinking, um, which is more in the ideal, and we need that. I also know as a teacher as a former teacher that implementing is different. So I'm not suggesting this is an easy or accessible thing, but one thing that I think is really important that Secretary Ortega mentioned is sort of um, 
students, and this, this is my words here, but like co-creating knowledge, which is about, you know, centering and situating the things that students care most about as a motivator. And so we actually, the research bears this out too, that, you know, when there are when you're just sort of implementing as a as an educator facts in a classroom when you're saying like these are the things you must know um we know we have to do that that happens it's part of it's part of education um that's not always the thing that's going to motivate students and so when we're talking about civics we're talking about not just traditional forms of learning but also like deep learning that moves into application um, and political competencies more broadly. I just saw something in the chat that's like civics is politics, but it's beyond that. It's citizenship in the world. Um, and so I really think that um, ideally having students at the policymaking table, at the curriculum table, um, again, I know these are some ideals, but if we're really trying to figure out how to bring, bring young people into political life at a very early age, um, I, you know, I believe young people are incredibly competent and capable. Um, and so I think that that is, that is a hallmark and to Curry's last question in their forum, um, what I think is a reach. And I think that would actually really change the game if we, if we put the power in with students to, to make these considerations. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Abby. Um, so we, we talked about the reach and what, with the hallmarks of a good education are, but what are the barriers to that? We know what we know what our ideal is. We know what we want to achieve. But what barriers are you seeing personally, and what are Abby? Maybe what are we seeing across uh, the Commonwealth and, and across this, the country? Do you want me to start with this one? Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, I think um, I think every person who is engaged in education at different levels is going to re be acutely experiencing different kinds of barriers. Um, I think we should just name, and this has been said that. Um, civics and social science has sort of become a cultural frontier for a lot of the political challenges that we face. Um, and there's there's some realness to that, but it's also sort of imposed. If you know, if you know, if you're in the classroom, you know that it's always been complex and that, and my view, students are typically able to navigate these things, frankly, better than adults are, in my personal opinion. Um, so I do think one of the barriers though is um, we're not just talking about civics for young people. We're actually like needing to get this information out in these truly nonpartisan ways um, to families uh, and communities to you know emphasize that this is about civic life in a pluralist democracy. And so I think that's a that's just a real barrier that it feels sticky and difficult, but is is incredibly important. Um, and obviously I want to leave space for everyone, but I guess the last thing that I would just say is um, what was mentioned at the very beginning, like we are currently spending $50 on, spent on STEM to 0 0.05 cents, uh, 5 cents to um, uh, on, on civics education. Um, and that's a problem. That's, that's no, no shade to STEM, but um, you know, we are in this, we are in this era of federal accountability to, to education. So there are some non-negotiables, but we also, we also really need to deeply systematically, systemically rethink like what matters, what our school's for. Um, so I'll end there. Those are two very, very difficult barriers, but I think uh, I don't have a solution. You didn't ask me for one, but these are things that are incredibly important to think about. And we actually need to address them if we're going to move the needle on the ground. That's a big one. What are schools for? We need to, to reshape and get an agreement on that. Uh, Andrea, how about you? Uh, really, the biggest barrier for me is getting over that whole idea of like just political apathy in our students. You know, the students, they're, they are. They're so focused on STEM and they're fit, focused on all those math and science classes because they've been just told constantly, like, this is the important subject. These are the subjects you need to graduate. And really, you know, how do you how do you break them of that mindset when they've been constantly told that? Um, and so like that's the biggest barrier for me is because my class is mandatory for them. And so they're there kind of against their will. And I have to break them of saying, well, this is important. And you know, what you learn here is going to affect you even in your science career later. So like trying to connect it to what their future plans are down the road is typically how I try to, you know, get over this is, you know, they're like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't need this. I'm going to be in research. And I'm like, well, if you, if you create something, where are you going to get your copyright? It's not, you know, this is government. This is how it affects your life. And they just don't get that connection. And so I'm constantly like, okay, 
what's your interest? What do you want to do when you grow up? Guess what? You know, I feel like that dad from my, that movie, my big fat Greek wedding, like you give me a, you give me a major and I will tell you how the government fixes that. Or like, it's how it's involved. I feel like the dad from my big fat Greek wedding all the time. Um, and those then, research grants, right? Yeah. Funding. Exactly. That's a big one. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that's my biggest barrier is getting that student buy-in and that interest enough to just tough out the course and just give it, you know, as much effort as they're giving to their science classes. That's the flip side of the coin of what Abby had said about making it about what they care about. Right. So if that's even on the career level, let alone the social issues, that, that certainly applies. Uh, Sue, how about you? So yes, definitely student buy-in is an issue. Again, even at eighth grade, um, the focus is on math and science and those are the courses that they're most um, interested in and I'm not knocking math and science. Um, they're really not my, my jam, but that's okay. Um, but I think we need to reprioritize um, social studies and civics in particular education um, because we need a balance. It's not, it shouldn't be all or nothing. I think we need a balance. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and uh, tell, you, tell you another barrier that I keep running into. And it, it isn't just specific to civics, but the overwhelming focus on grades and not learning is a huge problem that I have yet to be able to solve. And I think it's a systemic problem uh, up and down grade level and across the curriculum. And I think it's, it's, it's also a cultural change that needs to happen yeah. because, you know, how do you tell how your student, how your child is doing in school? Do they have an A? Do they have a B? Do they have a C? And I don't, I feel like grades have become so overinflated that, and the kids are only focused on the bottom line. I see that every day and it, I feel like it's killing the inquisitiveness of kids, the desire to learn. It's all about the bottom line. And I'm not sure what we can do about it. I know there is a movement to throw out grades, but it's, I, I think it's easier said than done because they're still learning. They're looking for that grade. Um, and then the other thing at the middle school level, I would say is finding the appropriate resources. There are tons of resources and I've seen in the chat a lot that I'm not familiar with. And certainly I've done summer institutes with the Rendell Center and you know the National Constitution Center has great resources and I'm not, you know, a big, big shout out to them, but teaching eighth grade and I don't have leveled classes. So I have a wide range of abilities in my classroom. I have students with gifted IEPs all the way down to students who are struggling to read at a third, fourth grade level, all in the same classroom. And I'm finding that it's, I feel like Goldilocks looking for just the right fit. Um, iCivics is something, I saw that in the chat. I use iCivics a lot, but trying to find a balance of, of resources that I am not having to spend a ton of time rewriting, modifying up or down, um, it's, it's time consuming. And so, again, I don't know that I have the answer, but um, those are a couple of the bears that I would add to the others that we've heard. And I love that that prompted a ton of resources flooding into the chat which was great. Um, so we are going to be a hub of that information. I think that's part of the PA Civics Coalition too, that we strive to make good resources, teacher tested resources. Uh, available to teachers across the Commonwealth. Um, we are running a little late on time, so I'm going to have to wrap it up there. I do appreciate uh, all of your insights. These were uh, This was a fantastic conversation. If there's additional resources, please feel free to drop them in the chat. 
because we're saving that and we're going to share it. Uh, and I really do thank you for all you do in the classroom and in your work. Uh, and, and thanks for being here today with us. So tossing it back over to Dr. Rockstar, Harry Saltner. That was fantastic. And I just thank you all so much because it's not just the celebration of what is happening really well, but Tim said it best in the chat. Sometimes we don't have the answer, but asking the questions is extremely important. And that last panel is stretching us to what do we do next and what are our challenges? And if we want to continue to grow civic education, in Pennsylvania and across this country, it is not just about celebrating our wins, but also stretching ourselves and looking for new gains. And what an amazing group of educators and learners and teachers and school leadership all around. We thank you so much for joining us today. The PA Civics Coalition, and I dropped it in the chat about 30 times, um, is an organization that brings together some great partners across the country for nonpartisan high quality education it is led by our rock stars at the former members of Congress. It's bipartisan, joint partisan, everybody's in it together because we care about civic education. We care about civic education for schools, to support teachers, but also for the larger community. So if you work with an organization that wants to join PA Civics, please tell them to reach out to us. It is a happy civics community and we like to embrace more and more to do this good work and to amplify the great work that all of our educators have shared tonight and to ask those hard questions about how do we build this better? And there were so many amazing things that happened tonight. So please reach out to us tell us about other programs and so, you know, join in any of our programs. We like to talk about what Committee of 70 is doing at the PA Bar Association, the PA Courts, of course, the Rendell Center that really you know, spearheaded this entire program tonight. I'm gonna wrap up with just a few comments and quotes from the panel today. And I have to be honest, it is like the scroll that won't stop. There were so many good one-liners we joke at the National Constitution Center, we say, if give us a good one-liner, we'll make a t-shirt about it. And I think I have 50 t-shirts on my plan for this one. But one of the things that kicked us off was the judge saying, prepare, participate, engage, and have them be an active role. Jim shared earlier, good civics makes good citizens Good citizens make a good community. That is so unbelievably true. But we heard over and over again the importance of ensuring that our young people are at the table, not just beside us, but they're leading and they're active and it's relevant to them and what they know. We know that from Taylor sharing, we need to make sure we're practicing being devil's advocates. We have a lot of hard work to do, which the Secretary of Education, that's his job, is to remind us we still have hard work to do. But we also have to come back to our supporting schools and our communities and remember, it takes an environment of trust. Ms. Jennings said this so well. We need to embrace our difficult conversations, and I heard that from so many people. It takes work, it takes time, but as Myron pointed out in the chat, in the chat every student, every person, every day. That's what it's gonna to take to engage this democracy in what we are doing. So thank you so much for your amazing, brilliant ideas, the brilliant questions that are pushing us further and joining us today for your amazing amount of time. So thank you all very much. Have a great day and we'll see you next time with PA Civics.